and most of you know already that um, there are professional standards that you must meet in order to practice in that industry and your students need to A, understand them and know how to apply them and um, um, you assess them that they're capable in that field. Anyone familiar with um, collecting, uh, getting your students to fill out a whole range of forms that equate to the professional standards? Uh, this one's from the the key nursing body, Australian. Yeah, exactly. Highly regulated. Lots of paperwork lots of domains of competency. Anyway, there's eight pages of A4 paper that these, this, this, uh, the postgraduate nurses would need to fill out um, in order to um, self-assess themselves against their competencies. And some of you may be familiar with that already, that they would fill out the paperwork and then they would make a an appointment with their clinical educator or their supervisor to review those competent, their claim competencies and can be quite an arduous. Some of you have been in that scenario um, uh, either as a student or as a, someone <coughs> assessing students. So that, it's, a, it's a huge paperwork exercise. They're, given this paper, um, there are some issues with paper, managing the paper. Um, I hear there's a room somewhere in the trove that's full of paper of student competencies. I don't think many people go in there. Um, so students can look, because the, the students use this paper, it's full important paperwork, they need to bring it to their interview and they have these interviews over a period of time and they need to come back at a, um, at a uh, uh, summative assessment stage. So students can lose them as well. So there, you can imagine the whole paperwork aspect of uh, this uh, activity can be quite challenging. A lot of the interview time is probably not ideal. There's, you can only have so much time with the students, so it's really important to spend that time productively. A lot of it I, um, I've heard is about looking at competencies that they agree upon, just to make sure we agree. Because the clinical educator hasn't seen this paperwork yet. Quite often they see it for the first time at the interview. Correct me if I'm wrong with some of those, the nursing staff here. Um, so there's a limited feedback cycle. So there's, there, it can work. But um, it's quite an arduous process. So oh, here's some detail of the paperwork. Um, students rate themselves from independent to dependent on the competencies, and their supervisor would agree or disagree. And there's eight pages of this. So we moved we moved it to um, an on, totally online system, and. So you, some of you would say, well, instead of filling the paperwork on pen and paper, you put online. So what? One of the big changes is that um, the system allowed, prompted, and we built into it, that the student had the option to provide evidence of their claims of competency. And this is a big shift. And I suppose in the past, the paper exercise, a lot of that evidence would have been conversations they've had with the, their supervisor saying, yes, I have observed you do that and you are quite confident. But it's all conversational. Um, but in this environment, they're asked to provide evidence and for those who can read, not only provide evidence, but why? How does the evidence support this particular competency? So um, the student put it out online. 
the the evidence was attached where where required. Clinical educator reviews their paperwork, paperwork, their forms before the interview. So the interviews now can focus on where they disagree, the skill gaps, the performance gaps, rather than reviewing the paperwork. So there's there's a whole range of um, potential um, uh, improvements here. So what what are some of the outcomes? Um, time is better spent looking at the skill gaps. In terms of paperwork, it's all in a digital space and there are advantages to that. Big one, students took a more active role in their learning because they, they're being asked to A, consider what they're being rated on, but also consider what evidence would I have if I'm challenged. And um, and one interesting case, or what I've been told, is that some of the students who were looking at evidence had asked other people to validate their evidence, and there was a feedback loop that they'd never really um, discovered before. Oh, Terry, I look, can you validate what I, I was able to do this? And the, in terms of feedback, they were saying, oh, yes, you can, but, and that, so that other, there's another, um, uh, another feedback loop was happening in, in validation process, so they actually changed their conceptions. Unsolicited feedback from a lecturer practitioner at the Alfred. I've seen a real shift in the attitude of the student group. They seem to be taking more responsibility for their own learning. Oh my god. <laughs> um, identifying gaps and making appropriate plans I was so pleased when she said that because um, this is the students starting to do this and she was observing that there was a change in their attitude. As you can read, constructive alignment tells us that learners construct me from what they do to learn. Um, so this framework can support this. Okay, so what were the benefits as an outcome from the uh, case study? Um, more meaningful for all the, the students and their supervisors. Um, the staff were feeling that it was a much more meaningful exercise now, especially if the students are taking responsibility for their learning. Centralised to other management. It's, on, it's in a digital space now, and that room that's full of paper, of all those competencies and self-evaluations, no one's ever gone in there to collect the data. It's an enormous task. But now by putting it online in this space, there is the potential to um, query that data. In other words, potentially look at how many students in 2013 were rating themselves this at this point in time. No one would People are unlikely to do that because it's a difficult task. Now that we are collecting this data, there's all these other opportunities and potentially which students need some intervention early, possibly. So I'd really like to see some work done in that area. Um, so I think it's a big one. The collection of evidence to support the claims of competency puts the onus on the student. And look, in reality, I don't think they're providing evidence for every single competency in reality. I think where it really works well is where a student is claiming I'm independent and you know full well they're not. Okay, if you're claiming that, provide me the evidence. So where there is disagreement, it can be a powerful um, incentive to say, well, give me the evidence and let's talk about it and do that before the interview. So both parties come to the interview prepared. And the interview time is um, get spent. So um, in conclusion then, this methodology about asking students to self-assess, 
and create evidence portfolios could be potentially applied in a number of other frameworks. And the case I've just cited is about professional standards, and there are a whole range of industries, a whole range of disciplines where you have professional standards. Some are more um, hard nosed about it than others. But that's an obvious one. Um, I'd like to see the university look at the graduate capabilities, how students can show that they meet them. I get to see how that uh, a student can come up and say, yes, I meet them. Here's my evidence. Um, and potentially, if we were stretching a little bit further, learning objectives. If we were asked, if we were able to ask the students, well, what did you learn and how did you how did you meet those learning objectives? We had to, we got them to think about how they met it, and they took responsibility for that. Wouldn't that be a great thing? So there's a framework potentially there for um, self-assessment through the process of evidence portfolios. Thanks very much, Terry.